Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the disappearance and murder of a Canadian teenager named Sharon Pryor. Sharon went missing after leaving her home to go and meet some friends at a local pizzeria in 1975, and her body was found three days later. The case went unsolved for nearly 50 years, until just last week when her killer was finally identified through genetic genealogy. I love these cases. I just find them so fascinating, especially when the killer turned out to be someone the police never suspected. And of course, it's nice that families can finally get answers and at least a little bit of closure after so many years. But before we get into it, I just wanna say, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up because it really does help my channel and subscribe for more true crime content. So let's start off by talking about Sharon. Sharon Kim Pryor was born on February 9th, 1959 in Montreal, Canada to her parents, Yvonne and George Pryor. Two years after they had Sharon, Yvonne gave birth to two twin girls named Doreen and Maureen. It wouldn't be a girls party for too long though, because a couple years after the twins were born, Yvonne had their youngest child named George Jr. Then in 1965, Yvonne and George began to have marital problems and divorced, leaving Yvonne to raise four young children on her own. Yvonne and her children lived in the Point St. Charles neighborhood in Montreal, which was known for being a safe area with a tight knit family community. As a child, Sharon was described as a gentle, kind, and a loving older sister to her three siblings. Even from a young age, Sharon had always loved animals and had dreams of becoming a veterinarian one day. As a teenager, Sharon was a very responsible young woman who really cared about her family. She was said to be shy and cautious, but had a warm and welcoming smile, so she made friends easily and had a close friend group. She took part in many extracurricular activities, including swimming, basketball, and floor hockey at her local boys and girls club, which she had been a part of since she was only six years old. In 1975, Sharon was 16 years old and was what you would describe as a typical teenager who spent her time socializing with friends and her boyfriend. On March 28, 1975, Sharon and her family started their day like any other. It was a Saturday and actually the day before Easter, so Sharon spent the day painting Easter eggs so her younger sibling, George, and Stephen, who was a four-year-old boy the prior family was fostering, could do an Easter egg hunt the following day. Sharon loved Easter and was really looking forward to the turkey dinner and chocolates they would have the next day. After she was done painting the eggs, Sharon went to her local girls and boys club to pick up her Leo's boys jacket. She had finally sold enough raffle tickets to the club's sporting events to earn a Leo boys jacket. But when she got to the club, they unfortunately didn't have her size, so she was given a receipt to come back and claim her jacket at a later time. She then returned home and had stew for dinner with her grandmother, mother, and siblings. Later that evening, Sharon had plans to meet her friends at Marina's Pizzeria, which was a local teen hangout spot, and it was only a couple blocks away from the prior home. While Sharon got ready to go out to the pizzeria, she had one of her girlfriends over, and the two hung out while Sharon tried on many different tops before finally settling on one. When it was time to head out to the pizzeria, Sharon said goodbye to her mom and walked out her front door for what would be the last time around 7 p.m. that night. She and her friend parted ways shortly after leaving Sharon's home because her friend wasn't going to the pizzeria because she wasn't part of that friend group. And her friend actually asked her if she wanted her to walk her to the pizzeria, but Sharon told her, no thank you. So the two said goodbye and headed in different directions. Sharon's friends waited for her at Marina's pizzeria, but she never showed up. And it wasn't like they could just call her on their cell phones because this was the 70s. So they just assumed that she made other plans. It wasn't until later that night when Sharon didn't make it home for her 11 p.m. curfew that Yvonne knew there was something very, very wrong. It was not like Sharon to be out late and miss her curfew and not call her mom to tell her why she would be late. Her mom waited up all night watching out the front window waiting for Sharon, but she never came home. The next morning, Yvonne frantically called all of Sharon's friends, but no one had seen her. And she was very concerned to find out that Sharon had never met her friends at the pizzeria that night. Then while calling around and speaking with neighbors, Yvonne learned that a woman had been attacked by a man with a knife close to the prior home around 7 p.m. the night that Sharon went missing. 
The woman, who was named Cheryl, was 23 years old and was walking along Ash Avenue when a man approached her, grabbed her arm, and threatened her with a knife. Luckily, the commotion attracted some people to look over and scared him off, so Cheryl got away. During the struggle, Cheryl was cut on her hand and neck, but her injuries were minor. The assailant was described as being a 5'8 white man with blue eyes and a mustache that was squared at the corners of his mouth. He was wearing a dark blue ski jacket, blue jeans, and pointed toe black shoes. And when he spoke to her, he spoke in English, not French. Other than those details, Cheryl couldn't really remember anything else about the man because it all happened so fast. When Yvonne heard about this incident, she was immediately concerned because Cheryl was walking on Ash Avenue, which is actually the same street that Marina's Pizzeria is on. So Yvonne thought maybe since the attack happened at the same time that Cheryl would have been headed to the pizzeria, she may have crossed paths with this man. Eventually, the police got involved and launched a large-scale search into where Sharon went, but nothing was found. Ivana appeared on the news, pleading for her daughter's safe return, but three days went by without any leads or any clue of what happened to her. The police and many members of the community suggested that maybe Sharon ran away, but Yvonne knew that her daughter wouldn't do that. Then on April 1st, 1975, Yvonne's worst nightmare came true when Sharon's body was found. Her body was found early that morning in a rural area in Longuel, which is a city about 30 minutes away from Point St. Charles. She was found by a beekeeper when he realized the gate to his apiary was left open, which he knew he didn't leave it like that. He then went to investigate and that's when he spotted Sharon's body in the field about 25 feet from the road. He promptly called the Longel police, and when they arrived on the scene, they quickly realized that a brutal, brutal murder had taken place. Sharon had been badly beaten, her body was found naked from the waist down, and she had been sexually assaulted. Several pieces of evidence were found at the scene, including tire tracks as well as a shoe print. The shoe print was believed to be a men's right shoe size 8.5. A men's shirt was also found near Sharon's body that was believed to be used as a binding for her wrists. Based on the size of the shirt, police believe the killer was around six feet tall. Also discovered at the crime scene was a car seat cushion, a ring with the word love engraved on it, and a magazine page with a woman and a gun pictured on it. They also found Sharon's receipt for her Leo boys jacket. The coroner determined that Sharon's time of death was only about 20 hours before she was found, which suggests that the killer actually kept her captive for two to three days before killing her, which is just truly horrifying and pure, pure evil. I can't even imagine what she went through. It's just awful. Sharon was laid to rest on April 4th, 1975, and over 200 members of the community attended the funeral to express their shared horror over what happened. Unsurprisingly, this event terrified Montreal and knowing that the killer was still on the loose left everybody on edge. In the months after Sharon's murder, police interviewed many potential suspects, including the owner of Marina's Pizzeria, the beekeeper who found her body and his co-owner, as well as the man who owned the property beside the beekeeper's property. In total, over 30 men were detained and interrogated, but there was never enough evidence to tie any of them to the murder. Four search warrants were executed in Point St. Charles in 1975, but they produced nothing of value to the investigation. Police believe that the man who attacked the woman on Ash Avenue and Sharon's killer were likely the same person. They believe that when he was unsuccessful in his first attempt of trying to abduct a woman, he either ran into Sharon on the same street or a couple streets over. They made this determination because the chances that two different men both trying to abduct women in a low crime area like Point St. Charles was next to impossible. Cheryl was brought in to try to identify the man who attacked her, but she said that she wasn't sure. Sharon's friends and boyfriend were interviewed as well, but pretty early on in the investigation, they were cleared of any involvement. To help out with the investigation, an FBI profiler developed a potential profile of Sharon's killer. He believed the killer was in his 20s and likely knew the area well because he was comfortable enough to commit an abduction. 
He said the killer wouldn't have been a smooth talker or a high functioning member of society since when he tried to abduct Cheryl, he used a knife to gain control over her instead of coercion like for example, Ted Bundy. The profiler also said that this killer was likely a sadist because he kept his victim held captive for days. He also said that this likely wasn't his first murder and would be his last. Given that, he suggested that the police narrow in on men with criminal records. Police looked into dozens of leads, but it wasn't long before an entire year had passed without any clue who did this to Sharon. Over time, leads dried up and the Montreal police had to move on to other cases and Sharon's case was eventually considered cold. What's so scary is that in the years after Sharon's murder, there were many other similar unsolved disappearances and murders of young women all across Montreal and Quebec in the 1970s. I just wanna name a few, although I wish I could talk about them all. Only three weeks after Sharon's murder, the body of 30-year-old Lise Choquette was found dumped at a construction site in Laval. She had been beaten and sexually assaulted. In 1977, 20-year-old Louise Cameron disappeared after she was last seen stopping at a convenience store two blocks from her apartment to buy milk and cigarettes. Her body was found 11 days later in the snow in Sherbrooke. She had suffered a very brutal attack and sexual assault. In 1978, 17-year-old Lison Blaise was found dead just meters from her home where she lived with her parents in Montreal. She'd left a disco bar earlier that morning and was struck in the head and violently sexually assaulted. In 1978, 19-year-old Teresa Allure disappeared from the campus of Champlain College in Lenoxville. Her body was found in the Catacoke River five months later and her death was considered suspicious. Then 12-year-old Tammy Leakey disappeared on the evening of March 12, 1981. Her mother sent her to buy milk and some candy bars from a local convenience store near her home in Point St. Charles. She was then abducted only blocks away from where Sharon was abducted six years earlier. Tammy's body was found in a field in Dorval later that evening and her remains were found in a shockingly similar condition as Sharon's. As far as I know, none of these murders have ever been solved. These crimes might just represent a very violent era in Quebec but this led many people to believe that there was a serial killer operating in Quebec. Or at the very least, that Sharon and Tammy Leakey's murders are related, but that still remains a mystery. It is reported that back then, police forces really worked in isolation and failed to identify patterns. If there was a serial killer at work in Quebec at that time, which many of the victim's families believe, police never figured that out. Or they at least didn't share their suspicions with the public. Hopefully the recent news about Sharon's case will motivate the police forces in these respective areas to maybe look back into these cases. And maybe some of those families can finally get answers. There were a few updates on Sharon's case over the years. In 2004, police received a tip about a garage Sharon might have been held captive in, but this eventually led to a dead end. In 2012, a $10,000 reward was offered for any tips leading to an arrest, but no arrests were made. Police continued to receive tips for decades, and they interviewed potential suspects even 10 years after the murder. But all these people were eventually ruled out either through wiretaps or other information like they were incarcerated at the time of the murder. Sharon's family never gave up on her case and did everything they could to keep her memory alive in the community. Her family started a website, which is where I luckily got a lot of this information from, as well as joined eight other families of unsolved murder victims in demanding Quebec Public Security Minister to call a public inquiry into policing methods in the province. The Point St. Charles neighborhood did many things over the years to honor Sharon, including the local Boys and Girls Club she had been a part of since she was a little girl, created a scholarship in her name in 2004. Her family also made sure that her case stayed on police's radar, which was ultimately what led to her case finally being solved. In 2003, Yvonne called the police station and requested that they re-evaluate some of the evidence in Sharon's case, as there had been significant advancements in technology since 1975. And it was then that police were able to pull DNA from the men's shirt found near Sharon's body. 
but unfortunately the quantity of DNA was insufficient to make any comparisons at the time. It wasn't until 2015 that forensic scientists managed to lift a complete DNA profile from that shirt that could be compared to other profiles. The same DNA profile was found on a few other items collected from the scene. For years, police ran that DNA sample through many different Canadian criminal databases and compared the profile to some potential suspects they still had in mind, but they were unsuccessful in both of those methods. Then in 2017, the increasing popularity of people wanting to research their ancestry allowed police to leverage a whole new DNA database from around the world to compare to Sharon's killer's DNA. They started attempting to find a match for their DNA profile. It wasn't long before genetic genealogy specialists informed the Longell police that they had identified the surname of the man they were looking for. And it wasn't long before genetic genealogy specialists informed the Longell police that they had identified the family name of the person they were looking for. So if you don't know what genetic genealogy is and how it relates to solving crimes, well, the process involves cross-referencing DNA found at crime scenes with samples voluntarily submitted to services such as 23andMe or Ancestry.ca. Those companies then upload the samples to open source databases like GEDmatch, which is a site that compares DNA files from various testing companies. Then from there, genetic specialists use genetic genealogy, which refers to mining family tree records to identify who the DNA matches. So basically, if anyone in your bloodline voluntarily submits a DNA sample to one of these companies, these specialists can track you down using this method. It's just totally wild, and it's a game changer for so many of these cold cases. Back in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s, criminals would leave their DNA all over the crime scene and would have never dreamed that they would eventually be caught using this technology. Some police forces have been holding on to DNA samples for decades, just waiting for advancements in technology. When for so long, all they had access to was criminal databases for their country and sometimes even they only had access to the ones from their state. There have been so many breakthroughs in many cold cases using this new technology, most notably the identification of the Golden State Killer, which was insane. I'd love to do a video on that sometime soon. As well as a very infamous Canadian case, the murder of Christine Jessup, with her killer finally being identified after 36 years. So back to Sharon. On June 8, 2022, a lab in Montreal placed the DNA profile in this database for comparison and linked it to the surname Romine. It was the first time the name Romine had ever come up in the investigation and investigators had never heard that name before. The Longell police then used the surname to search through databases and newspapers and found a Franklin Romine who was from West Virginia but lived in Montreal the year Sharon was killed. In fact, Franklin Romine had lived only nine kilometers from the prior home and he had also lived in Longell at one point, which was where her body was found. His physical description matched that of the man who tried to abduct Cheryl. Investigators also learned that Franklin owned a dark red Rambler that used the same type of tires of a vehicle that left a tire print where Sharon's body was found. Police were not surprised to find out that Franklin had a lengthy criminal record in Canada and the US, including a conviction for sexual assault in West Virginia. It's crazy how accurate that FBI profile was. Obviously, it was amazing that Sharon's killer was finally identified, but unfortunately, the police were way too late because Franklin Romine had actually died in 1982. He died at the age of 36 in Verdon of an unknown cause of death, and he was buried in West Virginia. The Longell police then tracked down any of Franklin's living relatives and found two brothers that were living in the US. One of the brothers who lives in West Virginia said he wouldn't be surprised if Franklin was the one who did this to Sharon because in the past he tried to assault his brother's wife. The other brother who lives in Florida says that they never really knew Franklin because he was constantly in and out of jail 
from age 12 until he died in 1982. Franklin's remains were exhumed in West Virginia, so investigators could be 100% sure it was him. And then on May 23rd, 2023, the chief inspector for criminal investigations for the Longal police made the announcement at a crowded news conference attended by members of Sharon's family that after 48 years, Sharon's case had finally been solved. Sharon's younger twin sisters, who are now 62 years old, spoke at the press conference expressing how they were feeling about the news and thanked the many people who tried to help find the killer since 1975. The solving of Sharon's case will never bring Sharon back. But knowing that her killer is no longer on this earth and cannot kill anymore brings us to somewhat of a closure this long chapter of our lives. We are still grieving in the loss of our daughter and sister who was savagely murdered at the age of 16, March 29, 1975. Life has not been easy for us since then, but Sharon has given us strength for the past 48 years and especially today. Sharon is here beside us. She was a beautiful young lady with a heart of gold. Sharon excelled all that she did, be it at school or in sport. She was kind to every living creature and had hoped to become a veterinarian. Sharon was loved and respected by all who knew her, especially in Point St. Charles. And what's so amazing about this is that Sharon's mother is still alive to hear the news and finally got closure on what happened to her 16-year-old daughter 48 years ago. That's all we know about Franklin so far, but if there are any updates, I'll make sure to leave it in a pinned comment below. It'll be interesting to see if police can tie him to any of the other unsolved murders from Quebec, especially the murder of Tammy Leakey. I think the circumstances between Sharon and Tammy's murder are suspiciously similar, and I know that police were able to collect a DNA profile from Tammy's crime scene, so it shouldn't be that hard to make a comparison. Anyway guys, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please let me know your thoughts on this case in the comment section below. Stay safe guys, I'll see you next time.